you so much for, for coming. Um, I just, you know, really, first of all, I'm going to express, I'm going to read from my novel, which I just finished uh, two nights ago, <laughs> up in my little office there, five-year journey. And uh, I, you know, I just can't express the gratitude I have to the Radcliffe Institute for having given me this fellowship. It was, especially the last couple of years, were very rocky. A lot of things happened that were some terrible things and some beautiful things, like a baby being born. And, uh, but it was a lot of interruptions. So these last three months, to be able to hold up there and get this book together have been a godsend. And also, I just have such gratitude to my the other fellows at the Institute. Every single presentation I've been to has been inspiring. I've learned from it. I've taken things from it. In this book, you'll see this narrator now has a childhood memory of feeding whole walnuts to squirrels on Boston Common. <laughs> <laughs> and then later on, when he's trying to imagine his mother, a, a meeting in a bar between his mother and CIA director Alan Dulles. Aaron Dulles actually says to her, I hope you're enjoying your time here in Boston. And she says, the other day on Boston Common, we were feeding walnuts to squirrels. That's what it comes back. So, <laughs> um, This book, uh, how do I describe this book? In some ways, it goes, you know, Long Ride by Chickens was a young man's book. Now, not a young man, looking back on some of that stuff. Uh, maybe a, a sort of fictional assessing of a life. Um, it takes place over a five-day period, six, actually stretched out in a seven-day period, uh, when a narrator um, who has uh, uh, had a life in some ways similar to mine, uh, he's come back from Mexico City. Uh, he calls it for the Lord Jim reasons I did. He, he was happy, he was living there, uh, but the repercussions of a, a crime, he'd been involved in investigating repercussions for a lot of people, not just him, but he'd been warned that maybe he should get out of there. And so he moves back semi-reluctantly to New York. He's had a, a really a rough six years since a very bad breakup. He's been utterly alone for six years and and he, he's now 49 and approaching 50, and he's worried. And um, he's sort of thinking about these things. He comes from a family, and this is a big part of the book. During this trip, he goes home. He visits his mother, who's now in a nursing home. Uh, he visits, a, a, he has dinner the first night with a, a, a girl who's contacted for him from his high school days. Um, he's going to end up finally visiting his sister various people who are important in his life. So he's constantly having those encounters, but the way it's written, like, his life is sort of constantly churning through his head. He's constantly having to, to quote Thoreau, you know, what business have I have in the woods if I'm paying attention to something outside of the woods to keep himself focused on what he's doing. He's constantly scolding himself with that refrain. Um, and, uh, and the big event is that, like, in these, we came back, he's only been back in New York a few months, but suddenly, for the first time in six years, there are two women kind of in his life. <laughs> and he's very excited about that and wondering what it's going to mean and really obsessing on that. I think it's really, because, and you'll hear there's some rather rough parts. It's a really upsetting thing I'm going to read. He comes from a very rough, you know, he's had a, the, 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 it's about, I think, the long lasting effects of, of um, cruelty on people's lives. Uh, all, everyone in his house was certainly a, uh, uh, suffered a lot because of a very, very uh, violent father, which you'll be hearing about. And uh, he was, uh, I think that his sexual life at the age of 14 was very badly thwarted by a, uh, a terrible act of bullying in junior high that you will, you hear about the book, I'm not going to read about that, but it's a big event in the book. And uh, so it's about, you know, the trouble with intimacy and not being old. He can't, he's six years, and he hasn't been near anybody, but though his life is functional in every other way, you know? So that's kind of what this is about. So I'm just going to read a few parts, and, and if I have to say something to introduce them, I will. So, uh, what I believe is that even a seeming lifetime of loneliness can end from one day to the next, even from one instant to the next. You can never have loved and never been loved, or you can have loved and never been loved back, but either of those conditions can be reversed. 
become truly loving and loved, dismissing for the moment questions about what that actually means. For the very first time at 49, does anybody believe in such a fairy tale? Proust wrote in his novel that a man during the second half of his life might become the reverse of who he was in the first. The reverse. I believe that too. I even carry around a notebook specifically to copy down ideas like that. I have it right here. Alain Pateau, at the age of 32, took only a few hours, perhaps only a few minutes, to stop being the man he had been up to that time and to become another. That's Simonon from the prison. From a Cesar Haida novel, the phrase, the fantastic potential for transformation that everything has. He's far from being the first writer who's noticed that. He's always like checking his phone to see if like a message from one of these women he's sort of, any of his life has come in, so here one comes in. Uh, Lulu hasn't written, but Jocelyn Quinn, yay, has. Lady Jo writes, Hope you're having a good trip. Have you visited your mother yet? Don't forget to bring her those cookies she likes. I'd made a mean joke the other day that Joe hadn't thought funny about it being pointless to bring my mother her usual gift of a tin of French butter cookies because the next morning she wouldn't remember who'd brought it or even that the pretty Parisian tin on her sail was full of those cookies she loves. Whatever my mother remembered later, Jocelyn admonished, She'd feel pleasure in receiving a gift from her son, and also when she bit into a cookie. Anyway, she said, I told her my mother it wasn't so far gone. I seemed to want to exaggerate her condition, perhaps stealing myself when her dementia really would become that severe. You should enjoy her company and get as much out of your conversations as you can while it's still possible, Lady Joe advised. Give yourself a chance to escape to the Isabella, reads her text message, and say hello to Hercules for me. The Piero de la Francesco Hercules at the Isabella Gardner Art, Art Museum, I know she means. It must suck to be a therapist and suspect that everybody looks for encoded therapy in all your messages. It would make me want to be outrageously rude. Jocelyn, however, is a genuinely empathetic and thoughtful adult. Her values and po politeness so deeply ingrained that they are the authentic her. But waking up in her four-posted antique bed was like finding myself in a Henry James story of old New York. One of those singer sergeant women from the Penguin book covers lying naked beside me. The pewter-hued winter light in the parlor floor windows, her long bone-white body with protruding hips and carnation pink nickels, nipples, dark brown hair lustrous as mink spread over the pillow. It was the first boss woman I'd had sex with since the 1980s. That Peace Corps girl from Wisconsin who used to ride her motorcycle down into Guatemala City from Momos Tenango. But I'd vowed, since coming back to New York, not to racialize my relationships with women so much, a ludicrously optimistic vow, considering that I hadn't had been in any relationship at all in the six years since Gisela. Your long ago pre-Gisela pre Latina, Asian, and happy girlfriends and lovers, where'd that all get you, Frankie G? One thing's for sure, not one had a bed as cozy as Jocelyn Quinn's. She splurges on bed linens, made in Italy mostly, always freshly ironed white sheets smelling delici deliciously of detergent, a touch of lavender, goose down pillows and comforter. Huddled in her bed in the fr frigid air of that underheated apartment, I felt baked into a warm, fluffy meringue. There are Italian touches all around her apartment's otherwise New England colonial inn type furnishings down to the pot holders. Even the bathroom soap dishes and shower tray are by some Milan designer. She used to have a boyfriend who was a clinical psychiatry professor at the University of Bologna, lived with him there for nearly two years, and she keeps a doorstopper Piero della Francesca art book on the floor by her bed. Jocelyn couldn't believe that despite growing up around Boston, I'd never been to the Isabella Gardner. I really should go and see the Hercules, demonstrate that I'm thinking of her, that I want to try to experience beauty through her eyes and share her enthusiasms. Jocelyn's the one I should commit to, rather, the one I should commit to pursue, since it's not like she's asked me to commit to her. She had an especially cruel breakup with her professor boyfriend. Soon after pressuring her into agreeing to an open relationship, he fell in love with one of his own students, a girl 25 years younger. Back in New York, Jocelyn ended up in a rebound affair with a bang on a can cast member who chased her hard though he was married, five years her junior, with a two-year-old daughter he sometimes brought with him in the afternoons. 
They'd leave the girl to watch her Little Mermaid video in the basement den for about the millionth time while they fucked upstairs in the bedroom. She'd finally put an end to that one. Jocelyn owns the bottom two floors, the parlor in the basement, with a garden of a brownstone near Cobble Hill's little park and the Episcopalian church where we met on Christmas Eve, like in some cornball rom-com. I rent a one bedroom in Carroll Gardens. It works out between us. It's not far-fetched that I could find myself becoming a dad in less than a year, but that could happen with Lulu Lopez too. Can Jocelyn and I cross the multiple frontiers between us and love each other? Lady Jo, I've come to understand, considers me not white. Lulu thinks of me as white, an American gringo. At first she was bewildered when I reacted indignantly to that assertion, but now she likes to tease me about it. Mary Ann, his high school friend, probably still regards me as a Jew. Jocelyn asked me if I were ever to decide to see a psychotherapist, if it would have to be a Latino one. That was during that long conversation we had in a wine bar when, after I'd been telling her some of the usual painful stories about growing up in my town, but trying to be as funny about them as I could, Jocelyn said, but Paco, you really didn't get that calling you monkey boy was racist? Oh, come on, she exclaimed. I said, sure, but what if, but what if I, I said, but what if I really did look, what if I really did look kind of like a monkey? You know how teenagers are. She gave me a sternly skeptical look. I said, seriously, Jocelyn, I've given this a lot of thought over the years, and I've concluded that probably nobody in my middle school looked more like a monkey than I did. Okay, she said, you have curly hair, your ears are not small, but I really don't think you look like a monkey. I said, I, gre I greatly resent that you consider curly hair a simian feature. That's a totally false stereotype, Jocelyn. When was the last time you actually went to the zoo and looked at the monkeys? Anyway, you left out a certain chimpanzee facial expression that my adolescent classmates considered, I don't think wrongly, to be characteristic of me. I let my mouth hang stuporously open. Jocelyn brought the back of her wrist to her mouth as if to stifle giggles. But no, I said, I'm not planning on seeing a psychotherapist anytime soon, other than you, of course, off the clock. But what you're asking, I went on, is if you think only a Latino could really get where I'm coming from, right? You're suggesting that I could be fucked up in ways that a so-called Latina therapist might recognize, but that someone like you might miss? Jocelyn, straightening her stool, said, well, I was just thinking of how you grew up and where you spent most of your life in college and how your last long relationship with, was with a Mexican woman and just certain other things you've expressed. I think you do identify as a Latino, Francisco, and that it's important to you, even if you do sometimes display ambivalence. I understand that too. It's your nature to resist being put into a box, though not always. Sometimes those boxes provide some security, am I right? I sat there nodding and then I said, I guess so. She lifted her round, arms around my neck, leaned forward to kiss me and said, plus you're the only man who's ever hit on me in church and I let you. Wait a sec, I said. You think my hidden, hitting on you in church was like a Latino thing? <laughs> what suddenly popped into my mind was that pair of buff Mexican twerps in Night of the Iguana who danced bare-chested around Ava, Ava Gardner in her hotel gardener, garden, lewdly shaking their maracas at her until she shoos them away, ordering them to go fetch Richard Burton's luggage. And again, I found myself contemplating this mandatory New York intelligentsia insistence, a not so intelligent intelligentsia insistence, on racially or ethnically categorizing and label every damn thing, every person, every artistic or intellectual or political or any other kind of expression, like putting a brand stamp, a Chiquita banana on every banana, so that even a neurosis or painful memory needs to be compressed and segregated to such an origin in order to be coherently discussable on the therapist's couch. I know how exasperating these obsessions can sound to people from places where this pressure to identify people and everything else in this way that I so fucking despise doesn't really pertain. I wasn't despising it then, though, in the wine bar with Lady Jo, before going back to her place, because for once it was working to my advantage. Well, I said, I didn't, it didn't exactly happen inside the church, but it started there when the mass ended and I followed you outside, sure, lewdly shaking my maracas. But I don't think I'd need a Latina therapist to help me understand 
while I was hitting on a beautiful woman who was by herself in an Episcopalian church on Christmas Eve, I told her, any more than I'd need a Jewish one to analyze my fucked up relationship with my father. It was only seconds later, as I stared down at the zinc bar top, while maybe Jocelyn was considering my words, that the realization felt like a silent ax cleaving something open. I looked up and said, Jocelyn, in that town, it was really the mothers who were the bigots, more than the kids. Their faces came back to me one after, uh, one after the other, Ethel Brown meanly regarding me from out of her cold cream mask. The Jewish neighborhood mothers who stubbed my mom and were jealous of and, f of and feared her beauty. Mrs. Sacco, the sultry ignorance in that fish-eyed stare of hers, always going around in summer with blouses knotted to expose her midriff like she thought she was Ellie Mae Clampetoni. And Mrs. Lucas straddling the spine of her flying copy of Portnoy's complaint. Really, it was the mother's Joe, I told her, my voice rising. It was Ian Brown's mother, it was Ian Brown's mother, Ethel, who gave me the name Monkey Boy. Silently, I rebuked myself. The mothers, but so what? Come on, man, don't blame the mothers. And a little bit about Lulu. <laughs> That night of the snowstorm, a couple of weeks ago, Lulu stayed over, though she said her cousin would be angry. Even before he reached my apartment, where she'd never been before, on the walk from the pizza restaurant in Court Street, she'd never been to a pizza restaurant either, as opposed to an ordinary pizza parlor. I'd already fallen a little in love with her. Clinton Street in the fallen snow looked like a long straight logging road through a frozen forest, snow-piled branches, Shadowy white striped tree trunks, snow blanketed parked cars and trash cans, the occasional taxi run, rumbling past like a Soviet tank. Behind the trees, lamplight filled brownstone windows as if emanating from trench pyres. All this seen through a gossamer streetlight glare caused by snowflakes splashing into hot watering eyes. Mine and surely Lulu's too. That quiet winter storm with its comical intrusions. A woman, her Portuguese water dog, flopping along behind her, passing on cross-country skis, which Lulu also had never seen before. Her, the skier cheerfully called out hello, and Lulu's voice chimed back, hola. On one, way, on one way, Clinton and the cross streets, in both directions, men were riding bicycles, some with bike lamps, the clacking and clinking of pedals and chains, wheels softly hissing through the snow, hoods up, Stalking cats pulled low over dark eyes, peering steadily ahead, scarves tied over faces, freezing cheeks exposed, leather pizza satchels balanced atop, up atop handlebars and other food containers and bags in the baskets, the delivery, the delivery men and boys of Brooklyn, mostly Mexicanos, surely some Chapinas, Guanacos, Catrachos too, bringing sustenance to the people living in all those warmly lit brownstones. Mira los pelicanos, Lulu exclaimed as we stopped on a corner. Los pelicanos flying through the snow. Pelicanos, I asked. She grinned up into my face, cheeks gleaming, see, gleaming. See, los pelicanos. Lifting her mittened hand and dropping them to point ahead, Lulu said, look how they go in straight lines over the snow, Paquito, bringing food like pelicanos. Lulu, I love that, los pelicanos, I said, and put my arms around her waist, both of us laughing. That was over a week ago now. In a shared lexicon, Mexicans are now pelicanos. They're pelicanitos and pelicanitas. But Lulu, but Lulu hasn't phoned or sent a message in three days. Lady Joe didn't write last night either. But it's my turn to answer her last message. I should have at least texted a sweet good night. What am I doing? Don't tell me it's all going to crumble, no. No matter what happens, I'll never forget those pelicanos, the wild exuberance of our lovemaking that night, the most joyous I've felt in years. I'm willfully conscious that I have no right to put any demands or any expectations, certainly not yet, on a woman so young as Lulu. Let's see if I can keep my word. It's as, it's as if I want to be tested. Almost noon, South Station. I'm looking up at the schedule board for the train's track number when my phone vibrates. A text message from Lulu. It's in English. Tiny one, no. Oh, yeah, Lulu works as a, a nanny. Tiny wants to know, are more windows in the world or more children? So cute. I tell her that my friend know the answer. More windows or more children? Besitos. 
I walk out onto the long platform with a bounce on my step. Pelicanitos and now this? Isn't, Luli, isn't Lulu a poet? Lulu, Lulu's the one. I don't care what anyone else says about it. An in, image of myself walking into that purposely overheated day room on my mother's floor where I usually find her sitting in her wheelchair, sometimes dozing like a dormouse. This superflu superfluity of ebullience. I'm in love, spraying for me like silly spring over mamita and the other dementia and Alzheimer's sunk old folks, perpetually dozing, hunched, contorted in their wheelchairs, faces pale as frozen pie crusts. Are there more windows than children in the world or more children? As we pull out of the station through a sunny concrete ravine, this commuter train, its grimy steel floor, patched and scarred brown leather seats, reminds me of a troop carrier, maybe an East German IFA truck like the Sandinistas used. I managed to hitch rides in the back of a few, sitting squeezed on a bench between young soldiers and their AKs, smell of metal and grease, overheated bodies inside fatigues of heavy green cloth, overripe sweat, and always a slight but pervasive odor of shit, perhaps a result of what constant fear does to churning adolescent stomachs already infected with jungle parasites. But what business have I in the woods when I'm thinking of something outside the woods? My hands, fingers entwined, dangle between my knees. Sitting on a train as it pulls out of a station is a quiet right, a moment to sit and face the self, but not too long a moment. My hands resemble me more than my face does. I'm more recognizable to, my, my, to myself in my hands. Every day I look at my hands much more than I do my face. I unclasp my hands and stare down at their backs, at the mole in the middle of the left one. That young Sandinista officer, Jacinto, was convinced it was a stigmata star, scar and wasn't sure of my presence, present, presaged good or bad. But that was ridiculous. For this mole to be credible as stigmata, you had to imagine people worshiping a Christ dangling from the cross by one arm. But in my dyslexia, I've always relied on this mole to tell me which way is left whether trapped inside the instant of, that instant of panic, turn left, I only have to remember to look for the mole in the back of my hand. These are the knuckles that crashed into the side of my father's head, the second punch landing harder than the first as he fell forward, the, the appalling sensation of bone and skin through hair, a criminal punch in a way the first wasn't. I can never recall it without feeling a lurch in my stomach. Tani is the little girl Lulu Lopez au pairs for. Her parents are a Mexican opera singer and his wife a financial analyst. In a town like ours, there are easily more windows than children. The house on Wooded Hollow Road, for example, had, let's see, five downstairs windows, seven upstairs, plus the sliding glass doors onto the porch. The overwhelming numerical advantage of windows over children in Boston, New York, probably in any Western city, any city in China or Japan, too. But what about Lagos? What about Mexico City? More children than windows? Or might it be close to a tie? Traditional Maya village houses of one room with mud walls are built from mud packed with grass and sticks. It might not even have one window, just a door, often a half dozen children or more living inside. All over the world, poor people's residences, th throughout rural and village Mexico, the southern hemisphere, are more or less like that in the Amazon. Well, in every jungle environment I've been to, way more children than windows. Every child represents infinite windows, querida Lulu. So does love, questions open windows. I thumb these words into my phone, sit back. Jesus fucking Christ, did I just write that corniness? Did I just tell Lulu that I love her? Before the train reaches my stop, I quickly type, 80% of the world's children live in poverty, so more children than windows. They're really not sure. Moments later, I thumb, miss you. So he goes to this next section. He's visited, um, he's visited his mom in the nursing home, and that's been a very long, intense chapter. And now he's going to uh, have lunch with Feli. And Feli is a girl who, when she, she's, uh, you encountered an earlier version of her in, in Long Night of White Chickens. Uh, she was sent to live with his family by his grandmother in Guatemala when she was 14, basically. My mother, it's a, it's, um, my mother, uh, you know, so that she can go to college and, and, and study and begin to try to make herself into a teacher, as she eventually did, the mother here. 
uh, the, the grandmother in Guatemala, who actually is, has more money than the family up here, always sends a girl to help raise us and help with the housework. And, and this woman becomes like a lifelong, uh, incredibly close person to him, right? So he's come to visit her now. He's gonna see her now for the first time in, in several years. Um, he's in the taxi. And we turn into the expanse of old Charles River wetlands, filled in to make way for the industrial zone. High tech and online media companies. Oh, one other thing, and this town has changed so much since he was a boy there. It used to be a kind of working class Irish Italian town, and it's now become a very, like a lot of the Route 128, you know, suburban towns around here. Uh, the, the, the housing values have just gone through the roof and it's really changed, right? Uh, high tech and online media companies, the distribution hub warehouses of box stores and online marketers, the Boston television studios of a national network are located here now. Feli asked me to meet her out there at a sandwich bakery cafe instead of in the square where Gino's, formerly our town's best and almost only place to eat, is long gone, replaced now by half a dozen family healthy food options plus Thai and Indian. The place is nearly empty. Separate or together, asks the young counterwoman. I look over each of my shoulders and back at her. Together? Oh my God, she exclaims, clapping a hand over her mouth. I could have sworn you were with a woman. She's college-staged, lively Irish pug face, hedge of reddish curly hair down the middle of her head, closely shaved at the sides. I make a frightened expression. She giggles, believe me, sir, I'm not in drugs. I know this sounds weird, but the woman I thought I saw standing next to you looked like the French actress in that movie, Amelie. You know who I mean? I've seen the posters, I say. Well, I wouldn't complain. Oh, no, you sure wouldn't, she says carefully, going to pour my cup of, cheerfully, going to pour my cup of coffee. I sit, be a, sit by a window with my coffee. Feli's, what, 62 now? But it never matters how much time has passed since the last time. I always quickly reconnect with the teenage girl living in our basement on Sacco Road, who used to drag me in front of the TV to dance to Shindig or American Bandstand. Whenever I talk about Feli and the life she's made with her husband here, the respect I make, the respect I feel makes me reluctant to pronounce American dream with overt irony, but I do anyway, probably because the only part of anybody's life that's a dream, not just a hardworking immigrants, happens when they're asleep. Feli's second husband, Giorgio Montolivo, is, Argenti is Argentine from an Italian family that emigrated there after World War II. He's the head mechanic at a garage that, that specializes in re repairing imported luxury cars in Brookline. He and Feli bought a small house in our town at one edge of the wooded swamp that is bordered on the, on the opposite side by where the Kirby rubber factory used to be. When Feli and Giorgio were in the process of closing on their house, the neighbor circulated and signed a petition that they brought to the realtor, protesting that the sale of the house to Spanish people would lower their own property values and demanding the sale be rescinded. But the Italian-American realtor, a car buff and soccer fan who'd hit it off with Giorgio took a stand. Still, Feli hasn't spoken a word to those neighbors from the day she moved in until now. Not one word. Their two daughters, both taller than her parents, went to high school in our town and to good colleges. And afterward, Gina married a young man from a prosperous family that owns several locally famous seafood restaurants. And the other, Jenny, became an investment banker married to an investment banker. They live in a house on the North Shore. They've given Feli and Giorgio four grandchildren. My sister's relationship with Feli is a bit strained. Once, when, Fanny told, when Feli told Lexi, you and Frankie really had two mothers when you were children, she says that Lexi answered, I have one mother, who was the other one? Whenever we meet, Feli retells that anecdote as if she's still hurt by it. But I wonder if Lexi was just being literal and generally didn't understand what Feli meant. Through the window, I see Feli drive into the parking lot in her blood orange Jaguar, a late 70s or 80s model that Giorgio re rescued from, from scrap at his garage and beautifully restored. She crosses the parking lot, sprightly as ever, pixie hairdo tied a dark, dyed a dark reddish hue, 
big sunglasses of a coppery tint, sprightly as ever. Pixie hairdo dyed a dark reddish hue, big sunglasses of coppery tint, majesta lipstick, tight maroon, maroon corduroys, a waist-length leopard skin jacket. Must be fake fur, but who knows? When she comes into the front door and sees me, she puts her hands out by her sides and sways her hips like she's inviting me to dance and exclaims, Frankie. Philly always greets me like that. Her caramel features are a bit sharper, more drawn, but she's the same. She could easily pass for a woman in her 40s. When we go up to order, the counter woman's grin is rakish as she says, separate or together, sir. She thinks Feli is my wife or partner. I give a cartoonish wink, answer together, and order the meatloaf sandwich special and a bottle of Snapple. Feli has an apple spice muffin and chamomile tea. Back at the table, Feli explains that she wanted to meet out here instead of in the square because she's fed up with the way even the young mothers in our town stare at her. The other day, she was in Walgreens speaking in Spanish on her cell phone, and as she approached the cash register line, she was so provoked by a woman's stare that she erupted, excuse me, do you know me? Have we met? Then why do you look at me like that? It bother you that I'm speaking Spanish? It's not illegal, right? Because Philly laughs, I do too. I know, Frankie, she goes on. Every year, this town get richer, and the people get worse, and she puts two fingers under her nose and lifts it, pulling her lips up too. I don't doubt the truth of that, or that the town is as white as ever, but I also think that those young mothers mostly see other adults who resemble themselves day after day and never encounter anyone who looks and dresses like Feli, driving around in her magnificent old Jaguar. She clearly isn't somebody's nanny. I've finished my sandwich, but Feli has only eaten some pinched morsels of her muffin. I'm tempted to tell her about my conversation with my mother in Green Meadows yesterday, but instead, I ask her what my parents' marriage was like back then during those first years when she was living with us. Did they at least get along a little better back then than they did later? You'd think I'm doing research for the Newlywed Games special 50-year anniversary show. I'm about to make that joke, but Feli's expression, the way she takes off her sunglasses, stops me. In her amber eyes, smallish, rimmed in black, there's something both unsettled and resolved shifting from one to the other inside of a second. Her voice surging, she says, oh, Frankie, what you and your sister witnessed in that house, no child should ever have to see and hear. I know, Frankie. Lily was too little, Lexi was too little to understand, but it was terrible for you. You were so frightened. You were always crying. I have no memory of what she's talking about. I remember standing on my green sofa by the picture window during that first winter in our town when I was recovering from tur tuberculosis to look out at the other neighborhood children who came into our snowy yard in their snow suits and hats to look at me on the, on the other side of the glass pane. I remember, I remember screaming crows streaming across the gray winter sky like the flying monkeys in The Wizard of Oz. I remember how icicles dangled from the eaves of the house and over the doorstep, silvery and transparent, narrowing into long, sharp points that make, might break off and stab deep down into your skull as you stood there ringing the doorbell, desperate to come in and pee. But I have no memory of what Feli begins to tell me about my parents. Twice your mother tried to leave your father in those days, she says. Twice she'd had her bags packed, waiting in the living room, ready to flee back to Guatemala and to her parents' house again. Once she packed for my sister and me too, but if, I, but if I understand Feli correctly, the second time she was going to flee without us. Both times, Aunt Millie, summoned by my mother, rushed to our house to tell my mother that she wouldn't allow her to abandon her husband, wouldn't allow her to destroy her brother's family and ruin his life. Feli says, Mr. Goldberg sat in his chair doing this with his hands. She pulls, puts out her hands, wringing them. But oh, she says, Aunt Millie scolded Mr. Goldberg too. She told her that he had to change or he was going to lose his wife and family. Doña Yoli was all packed and ready to go to the airport, but Aunt Millie convinced her to stay. Two times I saw that, Frankie. Two times I saw her convince your mother to stay. At your father's funeral, says Feli, Aunt Millie came from Florida in her wheelchair, so old now, and she apologized to Doña Yoli. At the funeral, I heard Millie say, I am sorry, Yolanda, 
for how you suffered with Bert all those years. I feel responsible because I forced you to stay. Aunt Millie felt responsible, Frankie, says Feli, and she apologized to your mother. Your Tio Memo didn't like to visit your mother here, says Feli. That's why when he came, he would stay at the Holiday Inn in Dedham. Tio Memo knows how your father treated Yoli. He always knew. Because of that, he couldn't stand to be with Bert. I didn't notice that conversation between Aunt Millie and my mother at my father's funeral. I wasn't aware of Tio Memo's hostility to my father when I was a boy. I was deaf to the icy nuances in the forced bonhomie with which Tio Memo spoke to my father. My mother sobbing in bed with her nightgown ripped off her shoulder, her skin scratched and bruised, scratch marks that bled. Feli seems to think I'd seen that too and must remember it. How could I not remember bloody claw marks on my mother's soft bare shoulder? My father, Feli tells me, sat on the edge of the bed, face in his hands. Then he got up shouting at my mother and went into the bathroom, slamming the door. That didn't happen just once, Frankie, she says. Maybe I saw it, or maybe hearing the commotion, I ran to the bedroom door, but I don't remember any of it. My mother would tell Feli to take me downstairs. Mr. Goldberg was impotent, says Feli. When Mr. Goldberg tried to make Don love to Doña Yoli, she says he couldn't. Then he would be enraged, and that's when he would hit her. Your mother tell me, told me everything, Frankie, because in those days, she had no one else. Her uncle, by whom she met Rodolfo Sprenger Balbuena, the Guatemalan army colonel who eventually rose to general, who she always says was like a father to her, told Feli that she should leave her house. She had no obligation to us or to anyone to endure such ugliness and sadness, her powerful military relatives said. She was young and had to look for her own happiness. But I couldn't leave your mother alone with your father, she says or abandon you and Lexi. I couldn't, Frankie. Feli tells me that Tio Meme's wife, Meche, phoned from Guatemala to thank her for taking care of my mother and of me and of Lexi. Tio Meche was right to thank Feli, I think. Because of Feli, I was happy, shut away as much as was possible in our own world in the basement, out playing down back, walking with her to the town square to buy penny candy, sometimes even going into Boston with her on her day off, to see a matinee movie and eat spaghetti and meatballs in the North End. Was Lexi, because of Feli, happy? Happy enough too? I think she was, I hope so. As a small girl though, Lexi was my father's favorite. But by her early adolescence, my father had turned on her, viciously insulting and deriding her. I used to find your mother shaking, Frankie, shaking like this, and Feli puts out her hands and makes them shake. He was brutal with her, Mr. Goldberg, says Feli. Oh, she suffered, Frankie. Your mother suffered, and she couldn't talk to her family. Your abuelita was such a strict Catholic, you could never divorce. You were supposed to accept your fate. And Doña Yoli was always telling her mother that everything was fine so that she wouldn't worry. I felt like I, I, like I was responsible for your mother, says Feli. I wasn't afraid of your father. God gave me strength to stand up, to stand up to him. I would get between them and say, I'm going to tell him in Guatemala what's happening, and that would scare Mr. Goldberg. That's when he'd turn and go away. Doña Yoli used to call me her salvation. Coney, tu eres mi salvación, she'd say. Her studies and then her teaching, that saved her too, says Feli. That was your mother's escape. Just one, the book ends in New Bedford, where I meet... Uh, I won't get into the whole story, but I go there with Abba Rubenstein Wong, who's a, uh, a lawyer for a war crimes unit in the Justice Department. She was adopted. I'll just read this teeny bit, even I go two, two minutes over, just to end on a more up thing. <laughs> um, it's, uh, but it begins with this little thing. In this, in this notebook where I copy down quotes, because it's appropriate to New Bedford, but it's, in this notebook where I copy down quotes regarding human transformations that can occur even from one moment to the next, I have one by Herman Melville. It's from a letter he wrote to Nathaniel Hawthorne. Until I was, until I was 50, I had no development at all. 
From my 50th year, I date my life. Three years have scarcely passed. At any time, three weeks have scarcely passed. At any time between then and now that I have not unfolded within myself. Actually, Melville wrote 25. I wrote 50. Because why the fuck not? Have a, have a, have a Hawthorne quote, too. In Wakefield, the magic of a single night has wrought a similar transformation. Because in that brief period, a great moral change has been effected. But this is a secret from himself. If he has changed, but in a way secret from himself, do others notice? I was adopted as a baby, says Abba. I was around a year old, but there's no way to know my actual birth date. It seems like I was born up in the highlands, somewhere almost certainly in Dijina, but, shrugs, what year, I ask? I just turned 30, so you can do the math. Yes, the massacres were getting underway by then. Well, you know the history. I silently calculate, definitely underway. Abba says, somehow, somehow I ended up all alone in the hands of soldiers and was turned over to a state orphanage. That's all I know. Maybe someday, she says, a DNA test will show that one of those skeletons be exhumed, being exhumed from the mass graves was my natural mother or father. But whenever I travel through the highlands down there, Francisco, I'm always terrified that at any moment somebody's going to say to me, you're a walking picture of Juana Coy. Was she your mother or some name like that? She explains that she was adopted by Clara Rubinstein, a geology professor at Michigan Tech in the Upper Peninsula, but was also adopted unofficially by her mother's partner, Mary Wong. The Guatemalans would permit a gringa single mother to adopt, but not a lesbian couple. But when she managed to track down her official adoption records in Guatemala City, she was surprised to discover that a social worker had written down that Dr. Clara Rubenstein lived with her close friend, Mary Wong, an artist who's going to help raise the child. Mary teaches in the tech art department, says, uh, says Abba. She started out teaching sculpture and pottery, but now she's all about earth art. The UP is obviously a great place for that. Anyway, Ma Clara used to go to Guatemala every few years on short-term contracts to work for an American company exploring for oil in the Paten. Needless, needless to say, Guatemala wasn't such a festive place in those days. To celebrate the adoption's official approval, which came through just before the Christmas holidays, Clara and Mary went to Tulum, Mexico. That's why, says Abba, on my first US passport, my name is Jaaba Jaba Rubenstein Wong, from the Yucatec Maya words for Happy New Year. She even writes it out in a cocktail napkin for me. Clara and Mary pronounced my name Jabba, she says. And that was a cool enough name until Jabba the Hutt made his Star Wars debut. So Jabba got changed to Abba. In grad school, she says, Clara at Berkeley, Mary at San Francisco State. Her moms fell in love to Abba music, dancing under disco balls. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> there you go.